You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. That man turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, would you remember me? And in Luke 23, 43, Jesus said, I tell you, today, today we're going to die. We will die. But today you'll be with me in paradise. I love that passage. I love, love, love it because you know what it does for me? It encourages me that those people I love in my life, they're not beyond Jesus saving. One of the most powerful moments in the crucifixion account is the interaction between Jesus and the man on the cross. Even in Jesus' final breath, he was still in the business of impacting people for his kingdom. In today's teaching, Pastor Ron encourages listeners with what this means for us as evangelists. It can be easy to look at the demise of some people's lives and think they're beyond saving. This couldn't be further from the truth. Your testimony to others could help change their eternity. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of John chapter 19 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. John chapter 19. So today we come to look at the love of Jesus Christ in his crucifixion for us. In verses 17 through 30, we have God's focal point and plan for salvation. God's redemptive purpose for mankind finds its culmination certainly here at the cross. It's at the cross. Jesus bore our sins. And so as one person said it, I thought so eloquently, the cross is not the end of the story. It's the theme. It is the theme of the story. Here we have the crown of redemptive truth. Here we have the center of Christian theology. And this is why the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 2.12, I I determined to know nothing among you except the cross of Jesus Christ. This is what I want to talk about. This has changed my life. And we're told, as he wrote also to the Colossians in chapter 1 and verse 14, that here we have redemption through his blood. We have the forgiveness of sins. It's all because of the cross. Nowhere do we see the love of God so supremely manifested than at the cross. And we could add to that, nowhere do we see the hatred of mankind and the depravity of man so supremely exhibited. As one person said, you know, Calvary shows us how far God will go to save mankind. But Calvary also shows us how far man will go in his sin in rejecting God. So today we look at the crucifixion. Now, we're going to be looking at these verses, and I've divided it into five bite-sized thoughts as John presents it to us. And we begin by looking at the suffering Uh, Of course, we need to kind of get a running start, remind us where we are. Jesus, of course, was arrested in the garden in the early hours of the morning, and he was brought before two tribunals. First, he has a religious trial. He's illegally tried through the late hours of the evening and the early hours of the morning. He stands before Annas, before Caiaphas. And just prior to the break of dawn, the Sanhedrin, he is falsely accused of blasphemy. As the dawn breaks, they bring him to the praetorium where Pilate is, and he has his you know, civil trial before Rome. First before Pilate, then Herod, then shuffled before Pilate again. And we saw that Pilate said three times, I find no fault in him. But in order to save his skin and to appease the religious leaders, we're told in verse 16 of chapter 19, he delivered him to be crucified. And so this is where we find ourselves in our text today. We begin to look at the suffering in verses 17 through 18. Now, let me say this, that it was customary as Jesus would then be crucified to have four soldiers put in charge of him. They would take the victim from the place of judgment to the place of crucifixion. So now these four men, Jesus is turned over to these four men and they will accompany him to the place of death. And so we read verse 17, now we jump into our text, and he, that's Jesus, bearing his cross went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Now, first of all, then, we see here that Jesus bearing his cross. So the Romans would have the very victims carry their instrument of death to the place of crucifixion. And one of these four soldiers, so you'd have four of them, one would go before them, usually carrying the accusation of their charges, a placard, 
One would be on either side of the criminal going through the crowds, and one would pick up the rear. Now, sometimes, and we don't know if it was the case of Jesus, sometimes the victim themselves would even wear the placard around uh, their neck. But they would be paraded throughout the city. And by law, they were crucified, as I said, outside of the city, not within the city walls. And when the soldiers would take the criminals through the city, they would take a circuitous route, the longest route, in fact, to, you know, strike fear into the citizens. This is what happens if you come against Rome. So Jesus would have been fitted with a cross, and he's now marched like a criminal through the streets of Jerusalem. Now, what kind of cross? Well, we do have a pretty good idea. If you've seen different movies and and so if you've seen different crosses, there was an X-shaped cross. And of course, tradition tells us that Peter was crucified on such a cross. There was also what we would call a capital T cross. And then there was a Latin cross also um, called a dagger-shaped cross. And we believe that this would have been the cross that Jesus was crucified. The reason being that we know that his charges were placed over his head. So that tells us that there was a, certainly a beam there. Now, the victims then carrying their cross to the place of crucifixion, then most likely, as is depicted in the movie The Passion, Jesus would have carried not just a cross beam, but the entire cross, weighing upwards up to 200 pounds. Now, that being the case, Jesus having already been scourged, already beginning to bleed out uh, and dehydrated, Jesus is not able to carry it all the way. So we know in Matthew's account that Simon of Cyrene was compelled, it says, actually commanded would be, most like it, that the Roman soldiers tell him, you have to carry it the rest of the way, and he did. So when Jesus arrives, and this is where we find ourselves in verse 17, he comes to the place of the skull, called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Now, the term there, skull, is cranion, and we get our English word cranium from it. The Latin derivative word would be cavaria, and that would be where we get Calvary from. So you think about that. The very name of our church, we get so used to Calvary, but it's depicted after the very place where our Savior was crucified. In Hebrew, it is Golgotha. So now we come to the crucifixion of Jesus and, and the Lord's intense suffering. And I'm going to spend some time here, but... Uh, some things we definitely want to talk about. First of all, we need to mention the fact that the Romans did not invent crucifixion. It would, we would actually believe the Persians did. Uh, the Persians worshipped a god by the name of Ormazd and the earth god. And so what they would do is when they killed their victims, they would impale them on stakes and suspend them from the earth so as to not defile uh, their god. And the Romans, uh, of course, when taking control, domination, took that and invented this horrible thing called crucifixion. Cicero, the Roman statesman, stated, quote, let it never come near the body of a Roman citizen, nay, not even near his thoughts, eyes, or ears, end quote. It was illegal. Roman citizens were not crucified. It was kept for the lowest of criminals. And today, we look at a cross. We think of a cross. Some of you are wearing crosses. You might have them as earrings or some form of jewelry. And we think of the cross maybe as something beautiful, uh, decorative, um, a sign of victory. Certainly, all those things are true in a sense. But at the time of Christ, that never comes into anybody's mind. And this is what blows the disciples away when Jesus says to them, if you want to follow me, you need to take up a cross. You need to die. Be willing to die and follow me. I mean, wearing a a cross at the time of Jesus would be like today wearing a little electric chair. You get the idea. Or wearing a guillotine or some form of of torture, of death. You, You wouldn't do that. And so Jesus is now carrying the cross to the place of the skull. And I want to read to you from the American Uh, Medical Association's journal. You've heard of the journal before. And uh, this was contributed to by several doctors. And I want to read in and out some of their statements here uh, to kind of just substantiate and speak from it from a uh, physiological uh, standpoint of what Jesus went through. But we need to back up as we go to the garden. First of all, as Jesus was in the garden, we saw this in the beginning of chapter 18, it says that his prayer was so intense he began to sweat great drops of 
of blood. This is hematidrosis. And the journal states, although a very rare phenomenon, bloody sweat called hematidrosis or hemohydrosis can occur as the result of hemorrhaging of the sweat gland as the skin becomes so fragile and so tender, end quote. And so what happens is that Jesus, in such intensity, his capillaries uh, under the uh, subcutaneous you know, skin begin to burst and meld in his, and, or pour into his sweat glands, and he begins to drip blood, which I find to be apropos in the sense where sin came in a garden, and now the blood of our Savior is first spilt in a garden. But then we know that as daybreak begins, or just actually prior to it, he stands before Caiaphas, the political Sanhedrin as well, and they blindfold Jesus, and they begin to strike him in the face with their fists, And then we move forward a little bit. Jesus is beginning to bleed. He's beginning to swell. He's dehydrating. He's lost sleep. And then they began to scourge him. The medical journal states, quote, the leather thongs and bones would cut into the skin of the tissues. And then as the flogging continues, lacerations tear into the underlying skeletal muscles and produce quivering ribbons of bleeding flesh. Pain and blood loss generally set the stage for circulatory shock. So this is what's happening or already happened at this point to Jesus' body. And then we also know from some other passages that they began to pull out his beard. So they're just ripping out his beard. The medical journal adds, continue, continuing, quote, the physical and mental abuse metered out by the Jews and the Romans, as well as the lack of food and water and sleep, also now contribute to his generally weakened state. Therefore, even before the actual crucifixion, Jesus' physical condition is serious and probably critical, end quote. So now all of that has happened, and now we come here to the crucifixion. And what do they do? Well, as they arrive there, the cross would be now laid down on the ground, and they would place the victim on top of it. Then spreading out the hands, they would take these, these iron stakes, which are not sharp, but fairly dull, but enough to drive through the wrist of the individual, not, not into the palm, but the wrist, in order that the body can hang without being torn off of the cross. Then the legs brought together, and a single nail placed through the metatarsals. I've, I've seen the pictures. I've actually been to the uh, museum over there in Israel, and you can see we actually have some bones where the, the stake is literally through a metatarsal, and it's there in place, intact. Finally, the victim is placed on the cross and dropped into a hole. The medical journal then continues, quote, the major pathological and physiological effect of crucifixion beyond excruciating pain is marked by an interference with normal respiration. This is the problem. Adequate exhalation requires lifting of the body and the pushing up on the feet and the flexing of the, the, the elbows and the abducting of the shoulders, this kind of action. However, this maneuver would place the entire weight of the body now on the tarsals, which had spikes through them, and those raw, injured nerves, they would produce this searing pain. Furthermore, the flexation of the elbows caused rotation of the wrists about the iron stakes and caused extreme pain now the, on the medial nerves. Lifting the body would also painfully scrape the scourge back against the rough wooden timber. Muscle cramps against the outstretched and uplift arms would add to the discomfort, As a result, each respiratory effort would become agonizing, tiring, and eventually lead to asphyxia. And this is how victims would die on the cross. They would suffocate to death over many days. Other contributing factors to death were dehydration, stress, induced arrhythmia, and congestive heart failure with a rapid accumulation of pericardial and pleural infusion. So you have all this water now gathering around the heart. Simply put, the journal states, quote, death by crucifixion was in every sense of the word excruciating, end quote. Now, I find that fitting they use that word because our English word excruciating comes from the Latin word excruciatus, which means from the cross. So our word used to describe the most painful thing you could possibly experience comes 
from the cross. And so when we consider already what Jesus is going through physically, it's, I mean, it's unbelievable. And then to try and comprehend what he's going through spiritually is overwhelming because then we have that understanding or try to grasp it. 2 Corinthians 5, 21 says this, God now makes him, Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin. He becomes our sin. And why does he do it? it? The rest of the verse says, so that we can become the righteousness of God in Christ. So he takes all my sin on him at this moment so I can become righteous. Unbelievable. And, and then to think that at any time, Jesus can stop this process. He can stop it. Really, is mankind really that worth it? We, we look sometimes on our own humanness and the humanness of others and mankind, and we think, oh my goodness, how evil can some people be, right? How degraded, how wicked. And yet Jesus knows that. He knows how wicked we are in our hearts and how wicked mankind is, and he still goes through with it. I mean, it, it's not that he has to stay on the cross. He does it out of love for us. It's not nails holding him. It's love holding him. And so there at the place of the skull, at Golgotha, at Calvary, it says they crucified him. Now, as he's hanging there being crucified, verse 18 says, and two others with him, one on either side, and Jesus is in the center. Now, these two robbers were most likely associates of Barabbas, who we saw last week who was released. He not only was a robber, a highwayman, it says, but he was a murderer. Jesus took most likely that man's place. He was to be there. And he's crucified between two thieves. And we also know as we read the other accounts that there was interaction going between them. And one of them was mocking Jesus. And the other man says, why would you do that? We deserve this. He's done nothing wrong. And then that man turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, would you remember me? And in Luke 23, 43, Jesus said, I tell you, today, today we're going to die. We will die but today you'll be with me in paradise. I love that passage. I love, love, love it because you know what it does for me? It encourages me that those people I love in my life, they're not beyond Jesus saving. Listen, some of you have friends, you have loved ones, you have people you care for. I know people that were not just family. I know people that I used to know 20 years ago, 15 years ago. They used to be, they used to come to this church and they've fallen away and they're living in a wicked life. And I believe Jesus can save them. I believe Jesus can work in their life. It's never too late. It's never too late. You might even be here today and say, hey, wait, you have no idea what I'm, I'm beyond. No, you're not. Jesus loves you. And he loved this man. So here we have this intense suffering of our Savior. But now in verses 19 through 22, I want to look at the sign. Uh, We're told that Jesus had a sign over the cross. Now, Pilate, verse 19, wrote a title and put it on the cross. And the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This was a placard. These are his charges, either worn over his neck or displayed before the front soldier as he was paraded throughout the streets. And then it was nailed to the top of the cross. It was a wooden placard. It was called a titleless. It would be the statement of who he was, and what his crimes were. Who's Jesus? He's known as Jesus of Nazareth, where he, you know, he grew up. And what was his charge? King. Pilate asked him, are you a king? He said, I am. And of course, the religious leaders didn't want to hear that at the trial. And so even when Pilate is turning Jesus over, he says, here's your king, kind of rubbing it in. And they even puts it on a placard. Then many of the Jews read this title for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. We understand it. It would always be near a main highway. That's where Calvary was. Why? So that everybody passing by could see. And it was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. So Hebrew is the Jewish language, of course. Greek was the common language. So the Greek language is now beginning to invade the world. And uh, now we have, a, even at this time, Greco-Roman culture, but the Romans still held, and it was the official language, and that is Latin. So it's written in all three languages, and Pilate made an inscription for everyone to see. But therefore, the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, 
but he said, I am the king of the Jews. In other words, don't, don't put up there king of the Jews. You need to change it. You need to say that it, he claimed to be king of the Jews. That's what it needs to say. But again, Pilate put this up there to insult the Jews. Pilate was upset. He was infuriated that they had blackmailed him into condemning Jesus. Of course, Pilate could have stopped the process at any time. He is not guiltless by any sense. But this incenses the religious leaders. They don't want anyone thinking that Jesus is the king, though he is. So they say to Pilate, you need to change it. And I love Pilate's statement in verse 22. Pilate answered, said, what I've written, I have written. In other words, I'm not going to change it. It's going to stand. And I love that because even in Jesus's crucifixion, Jesus will not be deprived of his rightful declaration. He is king. When Jesus was born, the wise men, and the wise men, and we went into a whole study on that, how the wise men, this generation of men, were actually kingmakers. And these kingmakers come, and they declare him, this is the king. Jesus, they declare, was born as a king. But then just at the early part of the week on Sunday, the very Sunday before this, uh, Jesus came being heralded as king. Remember, they hailed him as king, the king of Israel. And now in his death, proclaimed king. Jesus was born a king, hailed a king, even crucified a king. And by the way, he's coming back again as king. He's coming back as king. And every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he alone is king. So this accusation put over the cross, that was the sign. And now we have actions of the soldiers. The soldiers in verses 23 and 24. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, so these were the men that followed Jesus. These were the men who nailed Jesus to the cross. And now as he's hanging on the cross, they took his garments and made four parts to each soldier apart and also the tunic. Now, the tunic was without seam woven from the top in one piece. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, whose it shall be. So these are the four men. They've taken Jesus from the judgment hall to the place of crucifixion. They've nailed him on the cross. And now they're just going to take what Jesus has. That's what they were allowed to do in, in regard to staying there and watch. And uh, now Jewish men would normally have five pieces of clothing. You have your sandals, your inner cloak. You have a headpiece. You have a belt. And then you have your outer cloak, also called the tunic. So the soldiers were easily, able to easily divide the other four pieces, but not the tunic, because it's one piece. And because of that, they're going to cast lots. But to think of this, here they are, like it's nothing. They've, they've just treated Jesus horribly, and they mindlessly and they callously are casting lots for his possessions. But this, too, fulfilled prophecy. Notice verse 24, all this was done that the scripture might be fulfilled, which says, and this is a quote from Psalm 22 and verse 18. They divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. Therefore, the soldiers did these things. So uh, the soldiers obviously did this of their own volition, but in doing so, it also fulfilled prophecy. By the way, do you know there are over 330 prophecies concerning Jesus' first coming? There's even more on his second coming, but 330, and all fulfilled, every one of them. You know what the odds are? Well, they're pretty astronomical. Someone actually put that down, mathematical numbers. I don't know what the number is, because I don't know what 97 with, I, mean, I don't know what 97 zeros is. You figure that, I don't know where the numbers go after that. But in order for someone to fulfill 330 plus prophecies, it would be one in 84 with 97 zeros behind it. That's just a number that's beyond my thinking capacity. And rather, rather than try and figure out the number, I try and figure out a way to follow Jesus because he's God. That's what I want to figure out. And it's pretty simple. Just surrender your life to him. That's a lot easier than trying to come up with ways to excuse something that's inexcusable. Thanks for joining us here today on Larger Than Life as we go through the Gospel of John. Gospel means good news, and the good news that John shares is summed up in the most well-known verse in the Bible, John 3:16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's good news indeed. 
Today's teaching from Pastor Ron Hint and others like it can be found on our mobile app, so go to ltlradio.org to find the link. Larger Than Life is also available in podcast format, so please subscribe if you want to stay connected and immersed in our teachings. In case you've forgotten, that website again is ltlradio.org. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint in Friendswood, Texas. If you're in the Friendswood area, we'd love to meet you. We have Sunday morning services at 9 and 11 a.m. and every Wednesday at 7 p.m. If you have questions about what you heard today, we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to call us at 281-648-5800. Again, that number is 281-648-5800. Thanks so much for listening. We're so happy that you spent time with us today. Join us again next time as Pastor Ron has more to teach from the Gospel of John right here on Larger Than Life.